Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. Last time we started investigating the executable and linkable format, or ELF. We differentiated between a relocatable object file and an executable. In this video we'll take a closer look at how one becomes the other, what tools are needed and how our executable is, well, executed. In the process, we revisit once more a few earlier lectures. In particular, we go back to week 5, where we talked about the compile chain and the job of a linker. This will help us along our mission of understanding shared libraries, another type of file described using ELF. Let's start where we left off in our last video. When we ran the read ELF command on an ELF executable, we noted the different program headers, including the pt and terp header, which we observed to be pointing to a file user libexec ldelfso in this case. So where does that path come from? What does it do? And why do we need it? We didn't specify this path name when we built the executable, did we? Well, not explicitly anyway. But let's take a step back and review how we build an executable from our source file. We covered this process in more detail in our week 5 class, but let's recall that the compilation process is a sequence of individual steps each executed by the compile chain, possibly invoking different tools. Specifically, we know that in the first stage of the compilation we invoke the CPre processor CPP, to pull in all our includes, expand macros, etc. Then perform the actual compilation from C into machine-dependent assembly, then use the assembler to turn this input into an object file, a relocatable ELF file, commonly ending in .o. And only then, in the last stage of the compilation process, do we invoke the linker to create an executable by combining a number of objects, including specifying the dynamic linker option to pull in the runtime link editor ldelfso. The various object files required for the C runtime startup routine, and the object files we created, crypt.o, or if we invoked cc and let the compiler chain perform all the steps, thereby creating a temporary file as shown here. Next, we specified that we want to link against libc and libcrypto. Note, however, that we did not tell the linker where to find these files. We'll see in a second how it does that. And finally, the linker requires the C runtime epilogues to bookend the startup routine objects. Now taking all these files and rearranging a few bits, adding some information about where to find undefined symbols and all that, the linker produces the ELF executable. Let's take a look at a practical example. Here we have a very simple program. It uses the crypt library function, which we'll call to illustrate the use of a shared library other than the standard C library, libc. First we compile the object file, and then we run the ld command we just explained. We specify the dynamic linker, ldelfso, the C runtime startup routine objects, our object file, the libraries to link against, and the C runtime bookends. When we run readelf, we see that the pt interp header, the program interpreter, is set to the dynamic linker we had specified. So what is this ldelfso thing anyway? The manual page tells us that ldelfso is the runtime link editor a program used to find and load the various shared objects the program needs for execution. That is, when we invoke the program, the kernel passes control to this runtime link editor, which then uses information from the different ELF sections to find what other objects to load. The manual page also tells us how the link editor finds the right libraries. Remember when we invoked LD, we only told it, hey, we need libcrypto, but we didn't tell it where that library is found. So the linker and the link editor must have a way to find the actual files. Let's take a look at the dynamic section of our executable. Here we see that there are three shared objects marked as needed. libc.so.12, libcrypto.so14 
and libcrypt.so.1. So when we run the executable, we know that this will invoke the runtime link editor, which will determine where to find the symbols that we didn't stash into the executable, and then allow our program to execute. But how do we verify that ldelfso is really executed? Let's use the ktrace utility. ktrace is a tool to inspect what system calls are made, amongst other things, by the program. The tracing information is stored in the binary format, in a file that you can inspect using the kdump utility. Here we go. OK, so we call execve to invoke the a.out binary, and we notice that immediately afterwards we see a call to ldelfso, which proceeds to open ld.so.conf and then pulls in libc.so then libcrypto.so, libcrypt.so, before then moving on to actually do what we instructed the program to do. All right, so far so good. But what if we didn't specify the dynamic linker? LD still succeeds, and the resulting file is still an ELF executable. But notice that now the interp header requested is a different program interpreter, libld64.so.1. Let's see what happens when we execute that command. We get a failure saying no such file or directory. Let's check where this file ld64.so.1 is. Ah, it doesn't exist, and so kdump shows exactly that. The program tried to call the program interpreter, that file doesn't exist, and so execution of our program failed. But maybe we can avoid using any program interpreter? Let's pass no dynamic linker to ld. Just like before, we still get an executable, still of type elf, but this time there's no interp header. So what happens when we execute this binary? Oh nice, a sec fault. There it is. We try to execute the program, but immediately get a segmentation violation because our process is not set up in memory such that it can execute as it's missing the various symbols from the shared objects that our link editor would otherwise have provided for us. If we go back to specifying the correct dynamic linker, then everything works out again. So, ld elf so the runtime link editor, in a way performs the inverse steps from the linker. The linker took the various object files and created an executable, so the runtime link editor now takes an executable, inspects the environment, its own configuration, information found within the executable from the DTR path section, which we'll see in more detail in our next video, and a default location for libraries. Where it eventually finds the correct shared libraries to use, to then eventually produce the correct process image to load in memory. All right, let's take a break here. To recap, the linker combines the object files, the C runtime prolog and epilog objects, as well as any shared libraries to produce the executable. And as we just saw, the loader handles resolving these symbols at runtime by performing certain lookups and then produces the process image to allow execution. On some systems, Linux most notably, the runtime link editor is itself an executable, and you can pass it a program file to invoke. Give it a try and build an executable without a program interpreter. It should fail to execute, as we've observed here, 
but if you invoke the loader directly and pass it the executable without the interpreter specified, it should still execute. You don't even need execute permissions on the program in question, which comes as a surprise to some people. In our next video, we'll look more closely at what exactly a shared library is, as well as some of the peculiarities of the loading and linking processes. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.